Right, okay. Good afternoon or good evening and welcome. And thank you for being with us. My name is Peter Symes and I'm the editor and publisher of X-Ray Dye magazine. I'm your host tonight and main presenter and I'm addressing you from our headquarters in Copenhagen. And joining me from Izmir, Turkey is our photo editor, Rico Besedik. Today, I'm going to talk about writing for dye magazines and perhaps becoming a contributor or at least increasing your chances of seeing yourself published. Let me just adjust these slides a little bit. Uh, here we go. So it's about how to tell a story. And the topics I'm going to cover today will be text and writing, a little bit about images, other elements, editorial workflows, questions asked and answered at last. So as for questions, it's probably best to type it into the chat window on the right. If I can multitask, perhaps I can respond in real time, time permitting. Otherwise, surely at the end of, pr of the presentation. And please ask away, don't be shy. This is your chance to get your answers straight from the source. That's me. So if you want to come on stage afterwards, please do. So without any further ado, let's get rolling. When we tell a story, we relate to other people and we seek to connect and bond with our audience. In its simplest form, we may be sitting around a dinner table with friends or a campfire, socializing, relating tales, cracking jokes. And we laugh because we picture the scene in our heads. We all know that sensation of losing track of time when we're having a good time because we've been transferred to another place playing out in our imagination. A presentation such as this one, a book, a movie, a video, or the magazine which I have the pleasure of creating are but examples of media which we can use to establish that connection. But they are all just, they're all just means to an end. They're called channels. Let me just adjust this, sorry about that. They're just channels for getting your story across some space that exists between people. That is why they are called media. They are conveyors of information, of the story that you want to tell, demonstrate or teach. But all media has some limitations or some advantages and possibilities, which we're going to talk about. What matters is what you put through these channels and that what you have to say is meaningful and interesting, that you present it well in a concise, captivating and relatable manner. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about magazine articles in particular and what sets them apart from books, newspapers or websites. But a lot of my talking points today will also relate to other media. The main components of a magazine are a written narrative, aka the words or text, and images which are usually photographs, but can also be other illustrations such as drawings or diagrams. Secondary but required information comprised of captions, fact files, and refer uh, references. I'm going to talk about all those elements in turn, but first I'm going to talk about texts, then images. They are after all the two main components. And after that, how it all comes together and the editorial workflow that follows. While a magazine is a very visual oriented media, it's full of images. The core structure and most important element is the text. The text is the backbone upon which we hang everything else. We illustrate the text, not the other way around. 
although on occasion a story will be written to narrate a sequence of images, but that is the exception. The text is also the component which most contributors tend to have their foremost struggles with. I will go over some of the typical issues and challenges and provide some pointers, tips and tricks. What I cannot do, however, within the scope of this session is to cover what you were supposed to have learned in school. A frequent issue with submitted texts is the lack of structure, idea or clear message. It's often quite apparent that the writer has just started from one end, gone all over the place in no specific order or direction and wrapped it all up when running out of things to mention. But you wouldn't build a house that way without a plan or one room at a time before you got the foundation, foundations laid. Like when we do a drawing or a painting, just to come up with an allegory here, we don't start in one corner like the example here on, on the right, in the corner of a canvas of a paper, fill out the details as we work ourselves across the canvas. As you can see, it can go awfully wrong. No, as shown here on, on uh, the image on the left, we start with a rough outline and we build the image from there. We do the same with our texts. First, before we start to type, we should take a step back in what I call the helicopter perspective. And first, consider what do we set out to accomplish? What are the main messages or topics we want to cover? Who is our audience? And what is their frame of reference? Then we make an outline, which can just be some bullet points or a sketch with notes. This little drawing pretty much also illustrates just by chance the way I tend to work. I jot down ideas on pieces of paper, elements of the stories, different components, and I take notes on my iPad. But the most important thing is knowing what you're saying, going to say, why you're going to say, and how you're going to say it. In order to do so, you need to narrow down the essentials, ask and answer the right questions. Who, how, when, what, why? This is called the inverted pyramid. This is a journalistic principle in article structure. It actually comes from the news world. And what that is all about is that you put all the most information up front. You cover the main questions up in the beginning. It's not only to captivate the reader's interest and get them reading. And you put all the supporting details, background text, uh, general details, further down. This principle actually came from typesetting when they did newspapers. Uh, typesetters had these big wooden frames and they set type until they ran out of space. So it came about because the typesetters need to be able to trim the article from the rear uh, when they ran out of space, essentially. Uh, in that way, newspaper articles like the one shown on the right and magazine articles have an inverted structure as opposed to a scientific journal or a book. In the middle of this, uh, slide, you will see a peer-reviewed scientific journal. It starts with an abstract, then there's a background, then there's premises, then there's perhaps some theory, some experimentation, all the small bits and pieces that builds up to a 
discussion and then you have the results and the conclusion last you have the same in a crime novel typically unless it was uh, detective colombo which actually reversed that uh, structure on on tv and that's why we call it the inverted pyramid because you give the results first and then you explain it later on how it all come came about and and and, and the background in addressing these questions coming up in the answers you need to be mindful of your audience's frame of reference who are your readers what do they already know and understand and what needs to be explained i have here sort of just found three pictures out of an image archive there's a doctor in the middle she's an academic she will understand more technical literature whereas if you address a child or a worker with a different background you need to uh, supply that information that is required to catch your readers where they're at Oops, let me see if I can get this scrolling properly. There we go. Here's a little flashback. Sorry, let me just adjust this frame a little bit. It seemed to be a little short. Sorry for that jiggle. Bear with me just a second. Get the size right. It's a little... There we go. Okay, this is a little flashback in history. Uh, if some of you out there probably remember postcards maybe you haven't sent them yourselves but there's probably some in your family mementos or boxes from your grandparents once upon a time that was the way we sent messages for some back when we're out traveling or just before we had telephones but in this case what was specific about postcards is you knew the recipient you knew who you were going to send it to. It could be a friend or it could be your grandmother. So you knew how to address that particular person and you knew how to select the information that was important. So you were out there in, in some exotic uh, destination and you wanted to um, convey the message that everything's well, you're enjoying yourself and you have some nice experiences and you got some new friends. Sometimes you don't know your audience or your recipient. So in these cases, you have to exercise your imagination. Your audience, they can receive you, but you cannot see or, or hear them. Um, a magazine article is a one-way communication. There is no interaction you have to imagine what your readers are like and you can do that by putting yourself in their shoes imagine which questions you can expect arising from from the audience out there albeit even though you don't know them there are usually enough clues or references from from which to guess for example i am now in a context of this scuba digital show. And I can reasonably presume that people have an interest about diving by virtue of just being here or know something about it. So I do not need to explain very, very basic things about diving, such as clearing your mask and other such basics for us that's certified. But you still have to imagine what they would like to know. So here's an example of some questions to ponder if you are writing a dive trip review. The consumers out there, your neighbors, other dive buddies, they would probably like to know 
what is the best way of getting there? Is there a good season? Is it suitable for kids? Is it dangerous? Do I need vaccinations? Is it a romantic getaway for couples? Or is it a facility that's mostly catering for photographers or for technical divers? And how do you rate it? Is it a good facility or location compared to other options? And is it good value for money? All these are practical pieces of information. Not very sort of dreamy, but that's information that needs to be woven in there somewhere. But above all, tell a story, be a writer, sell the adventure, make us dream, carry us along on, on your trip, share your sentiments. Because sharing your experience is also a substantial proportion of an oral narrative. That is what is uh, captivating. Um, as I usually say, tell some of our business associates, we are in the business of selling dreams. You provide us escapism. There's a lot of people out there having menial jobs. Uh, they look out the window, they look at the clock, and uh, they dream that they are on vacation or holiday. So now you have all your components in place. You have to stitch them together in a sequence. So we're getting back to structure, aim, and scope, as I mentioned in, in, in the beginning. You pick out those elements that you deem is most relevant and in, in, in most uh, rounded story. So for example, Say you have decided to describe three dives or dive sites because they stood out in a way. You had a unique or enlightening experience or it was special or defining characteristic for this locality. Then you went on a night dive. You also had a couple of land excursions and maybe you tried out some local cuisine had some cultural experiences, historical outings, environmental matters that came across, or even politics, which can be relevant in the overall content in some cases. As a result, you may end up with perhaps 10, 12 bigger or smaller components, which you consider relevant and which together make up a somewhat complete picture or impression. These are your building blocks. Now you have to put them in order and string them together. Oops. Uh, come on. This is giving me a little bit of grief. Pardon me. It's a little bit jittery. There we go. My apologies. What I like to do sometimes is to mix these sequences, alternate dive experiences with other adventures or observations. And I also like being created with the timeline. One powerful remedy is to open the sequence that immerses the reader immediately in a relatable experience. I took a stride and entered the ocean in a cloud of bubbles, only to find myself facing the biggest tiger shark I've ever seen. The first one, really. It came out of nowhere. And there I was, no cage, no protection. And then the most amazing thing happened. Well, did I get your attention? Whoops. Note that this little story is not in temporal order. This is not where the trip started or ended. It's rather somewhere in the middle. In fact, doing reports like a diary where one event follows another in a sequence is often a good way of making a story really dull. This particular technique of a nonlinear narrative is called in medias res. Latin for into the middle of things. It's just one of the storytelling techniques. So I'm just mentioning but one example, one that I like to use. It's often used in movies. 
Just think of how a James Bond movie opens with lots of drama and spectacular action sequences, after which, not before, the theme music starts, and leaving you excited to get the contact and find out what that was all about. We get the background later as flashbacks or description of past events. And we can do the same. Why not? It creates some tension with story arcs. So thinking of an article, little like a movie, is actually not a bad idea. It's also a string of sequences or scenes. And it has to be wrapped up with some good ending or conclusion that ties up all the loose ends. So now you've got all your building blocks, each of which could become a paragraph or a section. And we have decided on the sequence. This is our plan or blueprint. And now we fill in all the blanks, one component of block at a time. Because we now know what comes before and what follows each component and how it all fits into the overall narrative, we have a framework for each one. We know where to start, where to end, and what to include. So that, so, so much about structure. Now we can get into writing, wordsmithing. Paint with words and create some images, evoke sentiments, just be creative, stimulate the imagination. Like I said in the beginning, it is a way of relating to others. So share what you felt, sensed, and what emotions or reflections from being in a new location or situation evoked. You're not doing anyone any favors by telling that the sky is blue, the sand is white, palms are green, and the staff was friendly. Aren't they all sort of mostly? Find those special unique elements that stands out or are defining characteristics of that location or your experience. For example, when I go to Egypt or Jordan, there's a special scent in the air that I find pleasant. Maybe it's a mix of sun-baked sand, vegetation, spices, flowers, and surely a whiff of charcoal or tobacco from people smoking water pipes. I've never been able to quite tease apart what's in that mix, but it's characteristic for me. I also feel another presence of centuries past and of eternity and timelessness. These lands have seen so many civilizations and cultures come and go, and there's still traces of them. They are the stage for biblical events, and is presently a geopolitical hotbed which I'm always mindful of when I walk the streets and which saddens me to some extent because these people deserve happiness, security and prosperity too. And, you know, oops, I thereby also put a wider context to the story. It's not all about just diving, but it's part of the whole experience of going somewhere. And I also happen to find it relevant as necessary context or precaution. As divers, we shouldn't just live in our little bubble. We're also citizens of the world. And again, in including all these bits and pieces, I constantly have my audience's frame of mind in, into consideration. And that is why I also described smell and sounds and what goes through my mind, because you can't show that in a picture. Because all senses form part of the experience. Okay, down to the nitty gritty. How to form proper sentences and punctuation will be a step too far for this presentation. As I said, it's not uh, any replacement for what you should have learned in school. 
But we do have some solid guidelines with do's and don'ts, which is posted on our website under contributors guidelines, which is a tap at the very top. It's dry as a tax code, but it is a very useful uh, tool. Uh, so I just leave that to you to, to, to download if this is something you want to sort of pursue later on. A few salient pointers though. Uh, again, um, an issue that we encounter frequently. Um, the crucial do's and don'ts include plagiarism and copy pasting versus citations, paraphrasing references. The first ones, plagiarism and copy and pasting are big no-nos and we will find out there are various software out there that does the job it's other newspapers and universities use them and we employ them too that is to protect us but it's perfectly okay to cite reference or paraphrase other sources and this comes in handy, in particular, we don't have access to primary sources yourself, but have to rely on what's been reported by other parties or secondary sources. And paraphrasing is easy. Examples use today CNN reported that blah, 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 about the story or blah, 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 the story, the element, according to BBC News. Meanwhile, in an interview conducted by Reuters, Mr. XYC stated that ABCDEFG. That is all there is to it, really. And note by using these variations, one can quickly build an article with varied language just by pulling on these various sources, again, like building blocks. And do you have sources? State them. Otherwise, you become responsible for statements and claims made. word count another frequently asked question how many words but unlike many other publications this is not a delimiter we employ we prefer to build the magazine around the articles rather than forcing them into some pre-allotted space but mind you even in the dive industry this will vary and it has something to do with how your general editorial workflow are. There are still magazines that will fill in the ad space first and then top it up with editorial content that has to fit. Uh, we don't work this way. In our case, each story or report that unfolds naturally in its own rhythm and roundedness ends up being of different length anyway, and we respect that. We also prefer to do as light edits as possible and rarely for length. That said, strive to be succinct, brief, and to the point. Resist being too wordy or long-winded. Otherwise, we will get the big red pen out. That said, there are typical 650 words on a spread, roughly corresponding to a page in a standard Word document. A spread is a double page. So what goes on that page too, obviously, are images and they may be an advert, a fact file. So just take a look at the magazine and, and check out other articles. You get the idea. Moving on to the next major subject, images. I'll go over images a bit more lightly. As mentioned in the, in the introduction, text seemed to be a more of a stumbling block in general. Besides, we got many instructional articles, tutorials and guides published in the magazine and on the website. You can just go to xraymag slash photo and find uh, a lot of instructional articles. Here's just some, some samples. But to give you an idea how we select images uh, and, and what criteria we, we apply. There are two categories is exceptional artistic quality, which is technical excellence, composition, all the rest of it. And the second day is, is whether it tells a story or illustrates a point. Uh, the latter is not necessarily 
technical perfect, but it can be essential. Image quality, here's just some examples of really bad pictures that we have, have seen. Uh, I don't think comments are really required. Uh, they're out of focus, they're underexposed, they're lacking dynamic range, there's everything wrong with it. Yet, in, in some cases, I have in all seriousness seen things like this submitted to us. Here are some examples of good images. Exposure, focus, composition, etc., is basically in order. Examples of bad composition. This, most of these pictures are simply misframed. The picture with the wreck is an obviously just pointed in in the right direct or in the wrong direction and well the others are, are not any better they may be exposed etc correctly but they're just framed badly if you look at the one on the right there's a little group of fish down in the corner they should be up and sit there. just imagine that if the fishes were up in the blue water then you would have a, a more balanced uh, composition here are some examples of exactly that. On the left, you see a, a composition where you can follow the lines. You are drawn into the picture and you're facing the diver, or rather the diver, diver is facing you. Um, quite frequently, we get a lot of pictures where the photographer has been part of a group and he or she will photograph his buddies from behind. That's what we call a butt shot. Uh, that's not very flattering. So make your model face you. Uh, about modeling, we, we do have another photo article on the site as well. But yeah, as you can see, there is good composition to all of these. These are about just by uh, but a few examples. I spoke a little bit about relevance. Uh, that can actually be two different things. Uh, of course, your images should describe what the text is all about. I mean, it's no use applying stock type photos to your story if there is no connection. But there may also be instances, say, for example, you are out in the tropics and um, you see commotion on the horizon when you're out of the bottom, and all of a sudden you see this plume of water rising up and you realize there's dynamite, dynamite fishing going on and you want to capture that. So you fumble for your smartphone and you just manage to squeeze off some shots uh, and you capture it, you document it, and it may not be completely aligned the exposure may be a little off and so forth but that doesn't matter because you can document it post processing or post one thing is taking the pictures but they also need to pr be processed afterwards in old days we went into the dark chamber uh, and tinkered with images uh, nowadays that takes place on a computer, we use Photoshop or any image editor. Um, frequently we see images that hasn't been corrected in various way. The histogram shows you the distribution of light and dark tones. And if you have a very mis-exposed picture, that peak there will lean to one side or another or will spill over the edges. And you can see it on the back on the camera and you can see it um, in your Photoshop or image editing process and get an idea for uh, the whole dynamic range and, and balance. And that needs to be fixed. If you're shooting raw files, that should be relatively easy unless you have completely uh, misexposed it. Color correction is another one that we see. Here's two examples. Uh, the lionfish is obviously not really green. Uh, so in order to restore the colors, um, you can do some white balancing. There, there's different uh, tricks, but make them look natural. 
Uh, one of my pet peeves here, cleaning and removal of backscatter and other sort of artifacts uh, before and after. Should be pretty obvious what is clean and what hasn't been. Uh, most notably, the art director on me, we do not have time or resources to do the cleaning of your images. Uh, so dirty images will be rejected or, or just returned for, for, for cleaning. Size and formats. Um, again, there are some guidelines posted on our website. We usually ask for 3,000 pixels along the longest axis. If it's vertical, that will be height. If it's a uh, landscape oriented, that will be horizontal. Uh, a little less for so for website social media uh, posts. And the resolution, that's a pic pixel count is what matters. And I just mentioned that. But for convenience, you can, may save our images in 300 DPI or 144. Format, Photoshop file, chip, PNG, JMP, J JPEGs, nothing mis mysterious there. A few notes, though. Um, JPEG format is a lossy format. And that means that every time you save the file, it will compress it a little bit. So if you produce a JPEG from your uh, Photoshop file, TIFF or RAW file, we need the first generation, not something you have Photoshopped over and over again, because it would degrade the image. And do not paste images right into the Word doc either, because we can't extract them. Additional documents we need to see is a list of images we name and uh, file names and photographer, just like a Word doc. Uh, and it's helpful to use a descriptive file name for the caption, um, like here highlighted in, in blue, an image name, a number with the location, dive size, species, um, and the photographer's name. And when it comes to captions, uh, we need that too. We need to know what the image is all about, and uh, why it is important. So explain the significance or context, not just the blinding the obvious, as I mentioned here, if you have a picture, don't just write divers in a zodiac or a duck in a lake, uh, but provide some context um, that makes sense and offers a little description. When it comes to submitting your materials, what we need, this is a little bit of a rehash, is text as a Word document, formatted as uh, the guidelines I've mentioned, and it should include references, sidebars, fact files, acknowledgements, and a little bio. Images in other illustration you do the selection and picking uh, do not send us a cd rom worth of 300 pictures so we have something to choose from we don't have time to go through that do send a limited curated selection say 20 in a folder with primary images you can call it primaries or a or b doesn't matter and then put the supplementary sort of spare one backup ones, secondary ones images in a separate folder again resist the temptation to send everything in the kitchen sink and again captions for each image and illustrations and please send them in one package one email preferably zip file works fine or shared folder on dropbox or we transfer and once you have submitted, don't keep sending us corrections and revisions, except if you discover a significant error or mission or something happened. Uh, then, of course, we'll look into it again. Because what you need to be mindful of is once it's been delivered, it's like putting it in the mailbox. We take it from there. We can't go back and start correcting corrections. Criteria for acceptance. When we receive a proposal uh, uh, for a contribution, what do we look into? First of all, is it relevant? Does it fit our media? Um, is it, yeah, is it a good fit for, for the magazine? Is it well written? Uh, is it captivating? And is the, excuse me, <clears throat> is the submission complete with all the information needed? Going back to the building blocks, is there something obvious missing, uh, some questions that hasn't been asked and answered. And then we look into, have it been done before? Is it another bucket list repeat? And by bucket list, I refer to this phenomenon that we encountered that a lot of the photographers, they like to go to the very, very same places. So if it's 
If it has been done before, is this different or offering a new perspective? Then we'll look into it. Has it been published elsewhere? This is not necessarily an, an making it a, a deal breaker or non-starter. It depends on the context. Uh, the world is big. There's different languages. Has it been published in a different language? Then it's usually not a big deal. Has it been published in English? Then it's usually not a big deal if it's not been recently and not in a comparable, perhaps even competing magazine. And layouts tend to be different. And most importantly, has it been submitted to other publications for their consideration? Uh, again, it makes everyone looks bad if the same story appears almost simultaneously in competing magazines or overlapping magazines. It makes both magazines look silly and the, also the writers and the editors. So once it goes into the editorial ringer, what happens then? Well, we will respond with initial comments, feedback, and perhaps some requests for clarifications or amendments. As I mentioned before, there may be some obvious questions that haven't been asked that needs a little bit more clarification. There are cases where we may require a review by section editor or third party, in particular, if it has something to do with hyperbaric medicine or technical diving, um where somebody with insights in into these matters will, will have to sort of assess whether um uh, the information is correct after that if it passes uh, we'll look into uh, doing um, edits for clarity and style um of course most people are not professional writers or, or media people and and, and we have uh, staff members who are so uh, and we do this for a living so we will clean up again as gently as we can because we like to preserve people's uh, personal idiosyncrasies and, and way of expression but uh, clean up we will and it doesn't matter whether it is in English, British English, American English, or something else, as long as it is consistent within the same article. So we accept all varieties as long as they're kept uh, within uh, the same uh, style. Then it goes into layout or graphic design. It gets laid out and put together. Um, after that, we will send you a proof for your final approval. Uh, it will look like the resulting work in the magazine. There may be a few uh, uh, adjustments made, but this is just for your eyes only and for you to, to sign off. You can't share this with anyone because anyone else will have to wait until the magazine comes out. And by all means, don't share it with, uh, say, for example, you were out on a compressed trip or something of the sort, don't share it with the operator because I guarantee you they will have a lot of corrections they want to make. Always do. They see it as an advertorial. Uh, so that's a no-go. Timeline, it can vary highly, but think of it that each issue takes one and a half to two months to, to produce. And we plan several issues ahead. Sometimes you we may have a hole like for the next issue where your little topic would fit snugly in. It happens rarely, but it does. Otherwise, it will be placed somewhere logically in the sequence. Sometimes it could be a little bit further ahead. There are cases where a travel to a destination is dependent on seasons. So as Nobody will actually start advertising ski holidays in the in the summer, but later on, the same principle applied to diving. So we try to fit it in. Um, that covered the main topics for this presentation. I invite you all to check out the magazine if you haven't already and the features and sign up for a free subscription. Uh, do follow us on social media. Um, and thanks for being part of this presentation. Now I am available for your questions and I'm not in a hurry to get to bed. So shoot or join me on stage if you like.
Any questions, anyone? Well, it doesn't seem to be the case. Let me see some direct messages up here. Uh, no, they are not related to that. All right, guys, thank you very much for your nice comments out in the chat. I'm around um, for most of the remainder of this expo, not at all times, but I will stick around. Uh, so do pop into our booth. Uh, if something comes to mind later on, you can ask me questions in a direct message. You know, the French have this concept, I think it's called response de escalier. Um, I hope I pronounced it right, but it goes to explain the sensation of you only think of a response you also wanted to give early on, only when you're going down the staircase and, and leave the situation. So if something crops, crops up afterwards, um, please feel free to leave a question for me in the direct messages, come to our booth or otherwise find me. On that note, I um, bid you all a good day, good evening, wherever you are.